This week I'd like us to overview God's call to self-control. And the, the first thing I need to say about that is that this is um, a, an incomplete sermon. You, you have to come back next week for the rest of it. Uh, but to combine this material with next week's material into one sermon would have uh, shortchanged both parts of it. And I didn't want to do this. So if, if it feels like there's uh, some big part of this I'm not saying, you're right. Uh, so be here next Sunday. I've never had a better excuse to tell you you have to come to church next week than that one. Um, and another way to say that is if, if, if you don't hear next Sunday's sermon too, what you'll hear this week is just going to result in failure and frustration for you. It, it's, it's kind of a dead end uh, by itself. We're in this series about sins of control, talking about self-control, and I came across a fascinating little passage this week that illustrates how the topic of self-control makes most people uncomfortable. You see it there in your handout, Acts 24. But some days later, the governor Felix arrived with Drusilla, his wife, who was a Jewess, and sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. But as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened and said, go away for the present, and when I find time, I will summon you. So I think that allows me to confidently say that this morning's sermon topic is frightening. It sounds like Paul was using self-control as part of his evangelistic message to this Roman governor. Isn't that interesting? I, I, we can't know for sure what Paul was saying, but it sounds like he was telling Felix, God is perfectly righteous. God calls all people to live according to his way. You don't do it because you don't have self-control. And as a result, you're facing judgment because you just follow your own desires and live your own way. So you have to have faith in Jesus. And Felix was scared. Why was he scared? You know, I think if most people are honest, they're going to admit they don't even do the things that they know they should do. Like even people who don't believe what the Bible says about sin will still tell you there are a bunch of things that they do that they wish they didn't do. Yeah, I wish I could control my eating or my smoking or my drinking. I wish I could control my, my, my language or my spending or my angry outbursts. I know I should. You know, people say things like that. Even, even the man who is incredibly disciplined with getting to the gym may not have any control over his spending. Or the woman who's incredibly self-controlled in her eating may not have any control over her tongue. Self-control is an uncomfortable topic for most people and probably not what we normally think of as an evangelism tool, but that's just how Paul seems to have used it with Felix. The good news is Jesus took the judgment in your place, you know, for our lack of self-control. So that's why we see in verse 24, Paul was speaking to Felix about faith in Christ Jesus. So self-control is an uncomfortable topic that leads us to our need for a Savior. It leads us to our need for Christ Jesus as Lord in our lives. Um, so we're going we're gonna to focus on our need for him next Sunday. This morning, I just want to try to let us hear his call to self-control. And I think those words in Acts 24 alert us to the fact that your heart does not naturally hear this call. Your heart naturally rejects this call. And so it's essential that we pray and ask for the Spirit to give us hearts to hear. Father, would you help us? Uh, we pray that by your the power of your spirit indwelling each person here who's born again, their heart would be able to hear a call that they would not otherwise hear, they would otherwise reject. And if there are hearts here that have never been born again, may they supernaturally, by the power of your word, hear that same call, be convicted of sin and righteousness and judgment, and come to faith in Jesus. So use this this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Three simple categories, general exhortations, specific examples, and then some motivations. So for the scripture reading, you are in 2 Peter 1. We'll look at that in a second. Would you turn back just a couple pages to 1 Peter 2? 1 
1 Peter 2. Summer is coming and the air conditioner is once again running up here, blowing my notes around. <laughs> 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. As foreigners in this world, abstain. We could put this together with 1 Thessalonians 5.22 abstain from every form of evil. Abstain's not a real popular word today. Not most people's favorite word. It means don't do it even if you want to. Where we get the word abstinence. God calls Christians to abstinence with a lot of things because there are things that will wage war against your soul. So don't do it even if you want to. <laughs> abstain. Look, look, uh, Go ahead to 2 Peter 1 now from our scripture reading. Verse 6. In your knowledge, supply or add self-control. Self-control. Greek word comes from a word that refers to force. I think we could say, be forceful with yourself. Have self-control. We could think of a verse like Proverbs 29, 11. A fool always loses his temper, but a wise man holds it back. He's forceful with himself, with his temper. Have self-control. So we have that word abstain. We have the word self-control. Then we need to add another New Testament word. It, it's maybe not a word we would immediately think of connecting, but it really does connect very directly. And that's the word sober. Look in first, back, go to 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1. Verse 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So here's the normal Greek word to describe a person who's not drunk. But it's not really used that way in the New Testament. It's used figuratively for spiritual sobriety. Being spiritually under control. Not being excessive, not being rash, not following your feelings, but living in a way that is in control. So you're supposed to picture a life that's in control like a person who is sober in contrast with a person who is drunk. If you can picture a drunk person, what Peter is saying by using this word is your spiritual life should look nothing like that. That word comes up a lot of other times in, in spiritual contexts in the New Testament. And let me show you two other places where it is in 1 Peter. 1 Peter 4 and verse 7. 1 Peter 4, 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. So, be sober because the end of all things is near. Uh, you know, there are times when you're driving on a long, straight stretch of road. We drive to see my parents in Idaho sometimes, and there are some stretches of central Utah that are straight on and on and on and on and on. And when you're on those stretches of road, when you know the road just keeps on going, you know, you can drive with a finger, you can drive with a knee, because uh, you know the road just, you know, keeps going. Now, you can do that because you don't have to have a lot of control. Okay, the speed limit there is 85, so <laughs> maybe you shouldn't drive with your knees. But th the point is, the, the, the lack of control that you lose when you start steering with your knee is okay if you're going straight for minutes at a time, right? Contrast that with those places we have here in Southern California where freeways end and all of a sudden, like, you're in side streets. 
like, I don't know, the ends of like 78 or something like that, where all of a sudden you come out, you're, you're going freeway, and then boom, wh- which lane am I supposed to be in? Where am I turning? All of a sudden you're in city, right? You, you can't drive with your knees then. You got to be a, a whole lot more aware and alert and ready and in control of that vehicle when the freeway suddenly ends on you. So you see, he says, the end of all things is near. This life is not like a nice, smooth, flat road. Everything's going straight and you can be sure it's just going to keep on going. You don't know what's coming tomorrow and it could be Jesus who's coming tomorrow. And so be sober, be in control and alert. This is not a time to be driving with your knees. And he says, this is for the purpose of prayer. A drunk person does not do a good job of remembering his responsibilities. He will miss really important things in his drunken stupor. He will forget to go to work. He will forget where his car is, whatever. And if you are not sober spiritually, you will forget really important things. For example, you will not be praying. And isn't that true? If I am just doing whatever I feel like spiritually, I'm just following my heart, who feels like praying? When you're just following sin, right? And so be sober, be in control for the purpose of prayer because the end of all things is near. If we aren't sober, if we aren't in control, we won't be in communication with the captain, with the Lord, with the shepherd, with the king, with the guide, with the helper, with the commander. So stay in sober in spirit so that you'll pray. And then is the more familiar 1 Peter 5, 8. Same, same word. Be sober. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. If there is a lion on the loose, get the drunk people off the street because they're likely to go try to give him a hug. Now, do you see the spiritual parallel? When you're not in control spiritually, when you're just doing whatever you feel like, You are that vulnerable. You are in that much trouble. The devil is on the prowl and you're likely to go give him a big hug and not even know it because you have no clue what's going on. You're drunk. (laughs) You're out of control spiritually. So be sober because the devil is prowling, seeking someone to devour. When there's a spiritual lion on the loose, you have to be sober, in control, focused. All right, one more passage before we leave this section of general exhortations. Go to Titus chapter 2. Titus, back not too far in your New Testament. If you haven't been around enough drunk people for these things to be really vivid for you, come talk to John after the service this morning and let him tell you stories from the road. Uh, And I think he will help make these passages more vivid for you. All right, Titus 2, look at verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. You see, our key word is in verse 12. The New American Standard translates it live sensibly keep your senses you could your translation might say live soberly most translations use the word self-control god's grace and god's salvation teach us to live with self-control in this present age see in verse 14 jesus came to redeem you from lawless deeds and 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 to create this person who lives for good deeds, for good works. So you say no to the lawless deeds. You abstain from them, even when you feel a strong desire in that direction, so that you can say yes to the good deeds because Jesus purchased you for that. So from these various passages, we can see God's call for us to be forceful with ourselves, 
under control, self-controlled, sober-minded, not just following every feeling, every desire, but abstaining from those things that will damage our souls. So God's people are called to live lives that are very controlled. I want us now to move into some examples of self-control, and we've got a whole bunch of them right here in Titus chapter 2. Look up in Titus 2 at verse 2. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, in perseverance. So we've got two words there. The first word in his list is temperate or sober. The third word in his list, sensible or self-controlled. Older men are supposed to be sober and self-controlled. That's what ought to characterize the older men in our church. Then we keep reading into verse 3. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands so that the word of God will not be dishonored. So we've really got the idea three times in those three verses. Um, It's really obvious in verse three, right? The older women can't be enslaved to much wine. And then in verse five, you have that word sensible, or again, we could just translate that self-controlled. The younger women are supposed to be self-controlled. But then we have it one more time, and it's actually, it's it's just, it's one of these Greek words that you just can't possibly, we don't have an English word for it. (laughs) It's just kind of impossible to to really get the idea translated into English. It's the word at the beginning of verse 4. The New American Standard says, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands. But that word encourage is actually related to these words for sobriety, and it means to teach them to live with self-control. Teach them to live with self-control. That's that's the key verb that explains what older women are supposed to do for younger women in the church. Teach them to live with self-control. Teach them to live soberly as Christian women so that they will love their husbands, love their children, etc. Over in 1 Timothy 2, the women are told to adorn themselves with self-control and continue in self-control. So the older men, the older women, the younger women, and then we just keep going in verse 6. Likewise, urge the young men to be, there it is, sensible, self-controlled. In all things, showing yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity and doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. So we have all these exhortations to older men, older women, younger men, younger women. Every follower of Jesus must live with spiritual sobriety and self-control. And then you see how that leads right down into verses 11 and 12. It's God's grace and it's God's salvation that bring us to that point, that instruct us to live with self-control. Okay, so we're talking about specific examples, older men, older women, younger men, younger women. Another category of people is if you look in Titus 1 verse 7, Titus 1 7, for the overseer, so this is an elder, a pastor, an overseer, the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, sober, just, devout, (laughs) self-controlled. Is there a theme here? He says it three different ways. Pastors are supposed to be people who live under control. You, pastors, are watching over souls. You can't be drunk physically or spiritually and watch over the flock of God. So another specific example is pastors. We could also then name people in the Bible who demonstrated self-control. And the greatest of those would be Jesus, right? So many examples we could give, but think of him, Luke chapter 4, in the wilderness, alone, so hungry after such a long fast, and the devil comes and tempts him face to face. And Jesus just takes the word of God, and with it, he says to the devil, no, 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 right? There's abstinence, self-control, no. Or we could think of Peter's words that, While being reviled, Jesus did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats. 
Do you think he felt like it in his humanness? Was there something that wanted to respond when being reviled? Yet he didn't revile, he didn't return, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't even threaten, but he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Jesus, Jesus came to fulfill all righteousness and part of that was perfect self-control in our place because we have not lived that way. A fascinating biblical example is uh, David um, because you have these very vivid moments of self-control with David, like when he's being hunted by King Saul and he has this opportunity to kill him. King Saul's trying to murder him <laughs> unfairly and David has the opportunity to kill him and he doesn't do it. He, he is not going to touch God's chosen. Or later in his life, Shimei Okay, David is walking out of Jerusalem and he's got all his mighty men right there with him and Shimei is throwing rocks at him. I remember watching somebody throw pine cones at a bear in Yellowstone thinking, are you out of your mind? (laughs) Shimei is throwing rocks at David with his mighty men right there and he's yelling at David and he's cursing David and David's mighty men are ready to wipe the guy out that moment and David won't let him touch him. And yet at the same time, we have David as one of the greatest biblical examples of doing what you feel like doing, just following your feelings. In between those two things, it's not like we can say, well, David failed with Bathsheba, but then he learned self-control. David had some amazing self-control before and after. And so David's a it's a, it's a very important connection then to 1 Corinthians 10, 12 and let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. And I want us to go there and I want us to see the context. The con- that's a, the kind of verse we just quote out of context a lot. The context is really important. So you can turn there to 1 Corinthians 10. Um, but before we look at that, another uh, Old Testament example we could mention is somebody in a situation just as tempting as David's, and that's Joseph. You know, in a different country, no accountability anywhere around, having had so much suffering and being so mistreated and everything in his life so unfair, and then here comes this woman seducing him. And uh, Joseph had the self-control to say no in that situation. And 1 Thessalonians 4 says, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. So there's the word abstain again. Uh, Sexual immorality is going to tempt everyone in one way or another. Uh, I don't think it helps. Sometimes people say, I'm especially tempted in this area. I don't think it helps to say that. I think it's better for us to recognize that every human being is tempted with immorality in different ways and followers of Jesus have to abstain from immorality, which is foundational to Christian living. And then in verse four there in in, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul says it another way. And there's, there, there are about three different things, that phrase, each of you know how to possess his own vessel. There are about three different things that could mean, but one possibility is that it means know how to control your own body. You have to know how to control your own body. So with that in mind, look back at 1 Corinthians 10. It's verse 12 where we have those famous words, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. But look, let's start reading in verse 6. Now these things happened as examples for us so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the end of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. So, uh, the, the context here is about the, the Israelites living without self-control. If they craved something, they went for it. If they were invited to an idolatrous party, they went to the party. If they felt like grumbling, they grumbled. They were out of control and it was deadly. And so Paul says, be careful, learn from their example. They just followed their feelings and they gave in to their desires. 
And he says, so, so you see the connection then? It's like he says, okay, now if you've been doing well with that, can I just say to you, be careful? You see how he kind of makes that jump? Even if you feel like I've been doing well with that, be careful. You have to soberly maintain self-control or you can quickly fall. All right, those are examples. Now, finally, motivations. And we're going to do this primarily just from 1 Corinthians. There are lots of examples of motivations, but let me just introduce this for a moment first. God calls all of us to self-control because he is very wise. He knows that every fiber of our sinful being fights against control. So when he calls us to self-control, he doesn't just call us to self-control. He makes it clear that when we obey him and say no to some things, it's always because we're saying yes to something better. Every time we say no for God's sake, we're actually saying yes to something else that's more God-honoring, more eternal in value, more edifying. We're saying no so that we can say yes to something else. And that's, that's the same principle we apply to like budgeting. One of the ways you get the, <laughs> you get the strength to actually start budgeting is you realize that when you say no to spending money on some things, it's saying yes to some other things, right? It's, it's what we do with time management. You realize that no, it's not actually that I don't have enough time for everything, but that I'm s saying yes to some things that I can't keep saying yes to. And if I'll say no to some important things, I will do that so that I can say yes to some other things, Right? And it's the same thing with self-control and spirituality. You have to see, because the world's perspective is that God is this mean God who wants people to have no fun. And so he just says, just say no to everything. Pretty much. If it's fun, say no. It's kind of like if it tastes good, it's not good for you, you know? That's the world's view of sin, you know? If, if, if it's fun and worth doing, God says no. And the Bible instead says, yes, God says no. That God calls you to abstinence about a lot of things. And every time he says you're saying yes to something far better. Far better. So let's look at that. 1 Corinthians 6. Go there, 1 Corinthians 6. And start in verse 9. Do you not know that the, righteous, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food, but God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord. The Lord is for the body. Well, there's a lot packed into those verses. Could spend a week just on that section, but uh, the verse that speaks most directly about self-control is verse 12, uh, when he says, I will not be mastered by anything. <laughs> The word means to give something the right of control. If you're a Christian, you have already given your right of control to somebody. You've given it to the Lord Jesus. And so don't give it to anybody else. You don't want anything except Jesus to be in control of your life. And it seems like Paul is reminding them of the things that used to control them, like immorality or like alcohol. That's what used to characterize their lives. But don't play with that stuff now. Remember how it hooked you before, you know. Remember that that's who you were and don't go back there. But then he goes even further and he says, it's, it's not just a matter of not going back to those things, but really it's a matter of looking at what things are profitable. See verse 12? All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. And we should pause and note that when Paul says, all things are lawful for me, he's not saying, I can do anything I want. Okay, he's talking about Old Covenant, New Covenant, as a Jew, saying that because of Jesus, I'm no longer under the law of Moses anymore. I am no longer compelled to obey the Old Covenant law anymore. In that sense, everything's lawful for me now. And particularly, he's thinking of food here. There is no longer a list of foods that as a Christian you can't eat. 
And beware lest other Christians try to give you a list of foods that you can't eat as a Christian. He's saying, listen, all things are lawful for me, but that doesn't mean that everything's profitable. It doesn't mean I'm just going to eat whatever I want. It doesn't mean I'm just going to do whatever I want. I'm going to say no to the unprofitable things so that I can say yes to the profitable things. That is such a mind shift for us as modern Christians that we need because our natural tendency is to say, well, prove to me that the Bible says I can't do that. Prove to me that I'm not allowed to play poker at the casino. Prove to me that I can't watch R-rated movies. Prove to me that I can't wear the same swimsuits other people are wearing. Prove it to me. Like, show me a verse. Prove it to me, you know? And Paul's saying, even if we can't prove it's wrong, uh, we still go beyond that. And we ask the question, is this really profitable? And we're also asking the question, is this going to master me? You know? Is it going to master me? And is it really profitable? Is it going to help me? Is it going to help my family? Is it going to help my church family? Is it going to help the unsaved people around me? Is it going to build up the Lord's glory? So we say no to some things so that even if we could say yes, so that we might say yes to something better. That's a life lived under control. Keep reading in 1 Corinthians 6 down in verse 18. Flee immorality. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Now, flee immorality. There's abstaining again, right? Say no, abstain, have self-control. As a matter of fact, flee. But what are you saying yes to? Your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit because he dwells in you now. Say yes to him. You've been bought with a price, so say yes to Jesus who bought you. Say yes to glorifying God with your body. See, when you say no to immorality, you are saying yes to the Spirit. You're saying yes to Jesus. You're saying yes to the glory of God. <coughs> Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians 9, 19. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all so that I may win more. To the Jews, I became as a Jew so that I might win Jews. To those who were under the law, as under the law, though not be myself under the law, so that I might win those who were under the law. To those who are without the law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law, not under the law of Moses. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men so that I may by all means save some. Woo! Boy, the yes is so clear there, isn't it? The big, powerful yes. I'm going to say no. I'm going to make myself a slave of other people in a metaphorical sense. To say yes to their salvation. He's restricting his own freedom so that he might reach more people for Christ. And this probably connects to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 34, when he says, become sober-minded as you ought and stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Be self-controlled for the sake of those who don't have a relationship with God. You know, uh, in, a, in, a, in a world where everybody is struggling with self-control, in a sense, everybody is out of control, doing their own thing, doing whatever they feel like, it, it really sticks out when somebody says no so that they can say yes to God. That really is vivid. It's really clear. And so he says, Would you stop sinning because there are people who don't know God at all. And they will learn that God is great when they see that in your heart and life, you are willing to say no to things that you really crave, you really feel like because you're saying yes to God and his glory. So we, we say no to uh, sin so that we can say yes to God. We say no to our own even freedoms to do things so that we can say yes to the salvation of others. That's a beautiful yes. 
And then in 1 Corinthians 9 again, well, no, no, look at me in 1 Corinthians 10 for just a second. We'll come back to 1 Corinthians 9. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 23. And 24. Okay, same words he starts with that we saw before. All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. Now he changes it. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Any, any construction guys here this morning? Edify is a construction word. That's a build a house word. Not all things build a house. Not all things strengthen a structure. Not all things build other people up. So then he says, let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. So Paul says there are lots of things he could do, but he says no to some of those things that he can say yes to the things that will make other people stronger. What if everyone made their choices in life based on what would build up the people around them? That sounds so much like a utopia. It sounds kind of absurd. But that's exactly what life in the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to be like. We all say no to many of our own desires and feelings and cravings because we're saying yes to strengthening one another. Yes to building one another up. So if we say no to sin, to many of our own cravings and desires, it is so we can say yes to the salvation of the lost, to the spirit, to Jesus, to the glory of God, to the building up of those around us. All right, um, so let's just pause and make that practical for a moment uh, before we add one more little section here. Remember the inline skaters again, right? Going 30 miles an hour through the finish line. Danger of plowing people over. When you're out of control, you do damage to others. And what we just saw is Paul saying, I'm going to say no so that I can strengthen others, build others up. So think about the areas of your own life that are kind of out of control right now. And I say kind of because we might want to kind of rationalize, I know, <laughs> human nature. But what are the areas of your life that, that, that tend to, you, you keep saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop or I'm going to get this under control and it just keeps not happening, you know? Can you see how in those areas, because you keep saying yes to sin, can you see how you're saying no to building up other people? Can you see some ways that you're continuing to say yes to sin? Maybe it's indirectly, but are you indirectly or maybe even directly harming other people around you because you're kind of out of control? Can you see how that connects to Paul saying, I'm going to say no. <laughs> I'm going to live with self-control so that I strengthen the people around me instead of harming the people around me by doing whatever I feel like. All right, so we, we've seen that we say no so we can say yes to, to the Spirit, to, to Jesus, to the glory of God, to the salvation of others, to the strengthening of others. But there's one more big thing we say yes to. It's not just for the Lord and for everybody else. It's for you. And Paul explains that vividly in 1 Corinthians 9. He says, first of all, in verse 23, I do all things for the sake of the gospel. So he's been talking about seeing other people saved, right? I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Huh. You see that? It, yeah, he wants to see other people saved, but he's thinking about his own participation in the gospel. He says at the end of verse 27, so that I myself will not be disqualified. <laughs> This is kind of hard theology, but it's eternally important. <laughs> Paul's saying that if he preaches the Lord Jesus to others, but Jesus is clearly not Lord in his own life, there's a big problem. If you claim Jesus as your Lord, but your life is characterized by doing whatever you feel like, getting whatever you crave, giving into every desire, Jesus is probably not truly your Lord. Now, Christians will struggle with sin and they'll struggle with temptation and they'll struggle with self-control and sometimes they'll cry out, ah, I'm doing what I don't want to do and I'm not doing what I want to do. But the point is, they will struggle. If you're not struggling, if you've just laid down and given in to your desires and you do whatever you feel like, Jesus is not your Lord. 
you're probably disqualified. You're probably not a partaker of the gospel. And so you might be here this morning and you have professed to be a Christian, but your life is out of control with sin and selfishness. And can I just, can we just say, based on what I think we're reading here, what the scriptures tell us, if your life is out of control with sin, you should not think of yourself confidently as a Christian. You cannot. You can't. Jesus is not your Lord. Now, if you say in your heart, but I want that so much, I so badly want Jesus to be in control, I so badly want to obey him, I just keep failing. Okay, good. That's a great start because the fact of those desires is very important. That's from the Spirit, okay? And we need to grow in grace. Look at the illustration Paul uses in between 23 and 27. Start in verse 24. Do you not know... 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. There goes the idea that we just need to give participation awards to everybody, right? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without an aim. What's the aim? To win. (laughs) I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body. I bruise my body into submission and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Wow. Run in a way that you may win. And the winning way is self-control. That's what verse 25 says, self-control in all things. He disciplines his body and he makes it his slave because he wants to win imperishable prizes. Here's how he said it to Timothy. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Paul is not ashamed to tell you that he is living for eternal promises and eternal rewards and eternal benefits. He wants to train and run and he wants to win. So here's the point. When you have godly self-control, when you say no to those things that will not please your Lord Jesus, you are saying yes to eternal riches and eternal blessings that you can't even fathom right now. The world looks at abstinence and says, what a ridiculous thing. God doesn't want anybody to have any fun. God doesn't want anybody to do anything good. And God says, listen, if you will say no to the things that I tell you to say no to, you will for eternity not regret it. You will reap the benefits of that for eternity. I I picture an Olympic athlete, you know, it's Olympics year, right? You picture an Olympic athlete and the degree of self-control that they have to exhibit to train for the Olympics. And you can, if you were just watching them train, you could start to really feel badly for them. It's ugly, dirty, sweaty, nasty, you know, painful. They're a mess. And you could look at them and say, I am so sorry. And they would probably look at you and say, what are you talking about? I'm going to Rio for the Olympics. Don't be sorry for me. I get to go to Brazil and you don't, and I'm going to go win. And that's just the attitude a Christian needs to have. Don't look at me and say, you're sorry that I don't get to go live in immorality like you do. Don't look at me and say, you're sorry that I don't get to enjoy the wonders of drunkenness like you do. I'm running to win. I got stuff to live for. I'm saying no because I've got some much better stuff to say yes to. So don't think of me as a poor, pathetic little Christian who doesn't get to have any fun. I tell you, I wouldn't want to live life any other way. And that's just this life. We're not even talking about eternity. I don't want to live for the momentary pleasures here and spend eternity in condemnation and suffering apart from Jesus. I'm going to enjoy the riches of God's grace poured out on me in Christ forever. That's what I want. That's a pretty big yes. So the conclusion this morning is really simple. God calls us to abstain from every type of sin and to exercise self-control in all things. 
It's a life of discipline. It's a life of saying no to really countless things because there are countless ways to follow your fleshly sinful desires. His grace and his gospel teach us to do that as we saw in Titus 2. But it's not just a life of saying no. Every no is a yes to something much better. Yes to the Spirit. Yes to the Lord Jesus. Yes to the glory of God. Yes to the salvation of others. Yes to those things that will build up others and strengthen them. Yes to our own participation in the gospel. Yes to an imperishable prize. And if you've been born again, and if you're truly a Christian this morning, then surely you reach the end of this sermon and you say, yes, I want that. I want self-control. That's God's calling for me. That is what's going to benefit others and me in the glory of God. That's what I want. And at the same time, you're thinking, whoa, this is hard. How can anybody obey these exhortations? And that's why you have to come back next Sunday. And here's the question I want you to think about between now and next Sunday. Can God control you? All right. Can God control you? We're talking about the struggle for self-control. That's next Sunday. Now, if you're here this morning and you've never turned from your sin to come trust Jesus as your Savior, please understand that self-control will never fix your broken relationship with God. You can't listen to this message and say, okay, I need to be a better person. I got I to gotta stop drinking so much. I got to stop partying so much. I got to stop my, my language. My mouth's bad. I got I to gotta clean things up. You, you, that's not the point. That's not the point. Because you're never going to clean yourself up to a righteous, holy person who obeys God and everything. You've got a sinful heart, and you need God to change your heart. And the way God will change your heart is through the power of the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so Jesus calls to out-of-control people and he says, come to me. Come bring your out-of-control life to him. Don't clean it all up first. You're not gonna get it all cleaned up. Bring it to him. Repent of your sin. And that means to, that means to both confess your sin to him, agree with God that you're a sinner, and in your heart say, I don't want to continue in rebellion against you. So come repent of your sin and believe in Jesus and he will save you, he will accept you, he will forgive you and he'll begin to change you into something new. So the point of this sermon is not go turn over a new leaf and do better this week. Jesus will teach you what it means to have him as your new king if you'll repent and believe the gospel. Okay, let's pray. And if that's you this morning, then you pray right now. Talk to God in your heart. He'll hear you. Express your knowledge of your sin to him. Ask Jesus to accept you and forgive you. Tell him you want him to be your Lord, your king. He will take you into his family, wash that sin clean, and begin to change you. Father, thank you for a great Savior. Pray that you'd prepare our hearts to rejoice in him and understand what these commands mean next Sunday. But I pray that you would uh, grab a hold of our thinking from this content this morning, that if we have been straying into just following whatever we feel like, you would use this content to grab us and get us back on track with a life that's not damaging to our own souls or to others, but honoring to you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.